We ended up last week, our, our foundational scripture was John 1, 1 to 4. And we ended up last week talking about um, the importance that we can't follow Jesus if we don't know Jesus. We can't be in a relationship with Jesus if we do not know who he is. Um, and we can never know who he is without his word. Uh, we have to know his word in order to know him. Um, and that's why Paul had said, I want to know the power. I want to know him and the power of his resurrection. I want to know him. There has to be a hunger and a thirst of ours to know him. We have no problem going in and saying we want something from him. But we have to be able to go to him and want to know him and know who he is and who we are in him. So he said of Jesus, God and God is Jesus and Jesus is the word and everything was created, was created by the word. It means simply we have to submit to the word. We have to have the word rooted in us and the word becoming us. We live, move and have our being in him, in his word. Because nothing that was created has authority over that word. So if we have the word in us, then we have authority with things over us. Amen? Amen. And one of the reasons we and, and, and Christians are so weak is because we don't know the word. Amen. The devil's not afraid of you. He's not intimidated by you. But he is afraid of the word. Um, so we have to understand that our, we have to know the word and be able to use the word in order to take authority over the things in our life and the authority over things in our world. So let's go back to John 1. Again, go to that fourth verse. Remember when the devil came to Jesus, and Jesus spoke the word. He, the word, spoke the word to him, and that uh, made the devil flee. He, you've got to fight with the word. Don't fight with yourself. Fight with the word. Let the word be what gives you your power. John 1 and 4. John 1 and four. God say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. All right, let's proclaim this real loud. Fourth verse. In him was life, and that light was the light of men. The light shined in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Now watch it. In, in these five verses, there's so much packed in here. First say, in the beginning was the Word, so God always was. He came from eternity, is in eternity. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, who identifies His identity as His divinity. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Nothing was made without Him. So His divinity, His sonship of God, um, the creative power in Him, and then now it goes on to say, and in Him was life. And that life was life. In Him was life. And that light was the light of men. Now, try to let this sink in a minute. Remember in the beginning, in Genesis, in the beginning, the earth was void. It was void and it was in chaos. It was full of darkness. And in Genesis, in fact, just hold your spring now. Go back to Genesis a minute. Now, in the beginning, the earth was void, full of darkness, and the first thing God said was, let there be light. Let there be light. Now, it's important to understand that the light he speaks of in Genesis 1, and when he says, let there be light, he was not speaking about the sun. Y'all hear me? He was not speaking about the sun. If you go to Genesis 1 and 14, look at Genesis 1 and 14. And it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night, and let them serve as signs to mark seasons and days and years, and let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to give them light on the earth. And it was so God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. And 114, he's talking about the sun. But in general, we, we commonly, people think that in Genesis 1, he says, let there be light. He's talking about the sun. He is not talking about the sun. So what was he saying 
when he said, let there be light in the very before he did anything else, he first said, let there be light. The light that he's speaking about in Genesis is the light of his glory. It's the light of his revelation, of his revelation. It's the light of his light. Before you can create anything else, you have to have light. Light has to create. So he said, let there be light. In other words, let there be my glory. Let there be my revelation. Let there be my light. I cast out into the world. Let there be revelation of my, of my glory in a dark place. We are called as the light bearers to be the revelation of God's glory in dark places. Our job is to go into dark places and say, let there be light. What do you mean? Let there be the revelation and the light of God in this place. The light of God is what creates light. That's why I said there in, in John, and John 1 and 4, it said, in him was light, and that light was the light. So the light is not the sun. The light is the light of God. So the first thing you've got to do when you walk into chaos and darkness is you've got to bring forth the revelation, the light of God. And when you impart the light of God, then comes the light of God. He knew, he knew he had to come into a dark place and a void place and first bring the light of God. So let there be light, let there be light. He knew that there could no be no light without light. That's why it is so important for us to understand when we try to go in our own power and our own ability and our own knowledge and our own charisma and our own whatever that you can bring your light of you but you are not bringing the light of light. When we come in to fight, we got to fight with the power of the light of God. Not our own power. Think you can handle something? These are powers of principalities. Flesh and blood can't handle that. Your light cannot handle what the devil's got in store for you. That's why we got to come in the light of God, and the life of God is what brings light. So when we're coming to bring light, when we're called to be the light bearers, we're called to be the revelation bearers of the life of Christ in the world. This is an important part. Watch it. He said, I have come, remember, that you may have life. Light. And have it what? More abundantly. Which means the dark place in your soul needs the light of God. There's a void in us until the light of God lives on us. And the light of God in us is what illuminates or brings light through us to the world. That's important to understand because you can't change the world without that light. You can't be light in the world. You can do good things. You can do nice things. You can do great things. But you can't do the God thing. And what the world needs is the God thing. So we try to do it out of self. Out of our own power and of our own ability. He's not come that you, you might have light. And then as you have my light, and have it more abundantly as that begins to consume you and make you and form you and shape you. Now you can go out in the void of the world and bring my life. The moment you get a revelation, it fills the void. Okay. <laughs> Help me, Lord. <clears throat> the moment you get a revelation, it fills the void. The light is in you, which means if I have a revelation, the revelation is the word of God living, ruling, and, 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 and forming and shaping and controlling me, then I can be in a dark spot and still be light. Because I got a revelation. I can be sick, but I can still have light because I know by his stripes I am healed. I can go into a place where there's all sorts of craziness going on, 
but I can still bring light because I got a light in me that's greater than the craziness. Once we start to understand that, then people and places and circumstance cannot control me. I come in with something greater than what I'm needing. Y'all hear me? So I don't get intimidated by what I run into. Because I come with the force that's greater. I come with the abundant light of Christ in me. Now, if I'm not nurturing and strengthening and growing and maturing in that light, in that word, then I'm weak. So my charge is to say, understand that I have the life of Christ in me. The life of Christ in me come to fill the void in me. So I can be in a dark place, but I still have light. I can be in a dark spot, but I still have light. I can be in a dark circumstance, but I still have light. I can be in a dark moment, but I still have light. And you will show up, and guess what? Light it up. Your job is to show up and to light it up. In other words, you can walk into a group of people speaking in a darkness moment and bring light and light up the darkness of which they're in. If you have this light in you, real light only comes through real light. Because you have a revelation from God. And if you are walking tall and, and walking through your life with this revelation, that's what makes people look at you sometimes and saying, how are you not all tore up with everything you're going through? I got a revelation. Okay. If I got the word of God, the revelation, the life and light of God in me, I don't surrender to my situation because this too will pass. I will either get through it or I will overcome it, but I will not be beaten by it. Do you hear me? Say, when I, say it after me. When I go through something, because of the light in me, and the light in me, I do not surrender, I do not quit, because sooner or later, I will either get through it, or I will overcome it. Now, the question becomes, well, why, don't, why can't we just always overcome it? Because sometimes there's a lesson God's trying to teach you that you've got to go through to learn. You've got to take the test so that you learn the lesson because there's something down the road. If you don't learn this in third grade, you ain't going to make it in fifth. So we have to go through the circumstance. Sometimes, sometimes let me also say this, sometimes you're going through stuff you don't have to. You don't have to go through some stuff. You, you, there's some stuff you can just take authority over right now and bind it up and walk over it. So, whether I got to go through it or I can just overcome it, that's, that's where God providence is in my life. But I have to know that I do not surrender, submit, be beaten down, be overcome by situations around me if the life is in me. In Genesis, he walks into chaos and darkness. It says, let there be light. And immediately, there's light. Now, why does he say that first? Because until I loosen the light, I can't create. Woo! If we are going to be co-creators, sometimes we're trying to co-create, but have not loosened the life of God in us. Because sometimes the life of God in us is locked away in some closet. Because we've been so busy living us. So before you can speak forth the things of God, you got to let loose the glory of God. you got to let loose the revelation of God. So, so I can walk tall and I can walk strong in the midst of situations. Why? How do you do that? Because of what I know. Let me tell you something. Life and the enemy can take everything away from you. 
can take your house, your car, can take away your job, take everything else away from your money, your clothes, they can rob you, and you're sitting on a park bench. But nobody can take away what I know. And like Job, if you take everything away from me because of what I know, I'll get it back double. <laughs> you hear me? You, you cannot. What did, what, did, what did God say? Go get my servant Job, but you can't touch him. Come on. You can't touch him in our relationship. You can't touch that. You can take everything else out, but you can't touch that. So understand, when you're looking, that's why I said faith is what? It's the substance of the what? Oh, and the evidence of things. So understand, when I don't see stuff, I don't see it yet. But guess what? Because of what I know, I close my natural eyes and I put my spiritual eyes and they begin to see what I know. So I can be in a barren desert and see waters to refresh me. Okay. Let me give you an example. Now, now I'm thinking, is Didi here? Didi, Alicia here? No, no, okay. No. They are here? Yeah. Alicia, Irving? Okay. Did Didi here? No. Didi Irving. All right. All right. Well, I'm going to say you can tell her later I talked about it. Um, <laughs> I remember for probably three, four years, little Alicia, Alicia Irving saying to me over in St. Tobias School, I'm going to St. Ignatius one day. I said, that's great. That's wonderful. You keep speaking that and leaving that. So I'm going to St. Ignatius one day. So she kept telling me, I'm going to Ignatius, I'm going to Ignatius, I'm going. Every time I see her, where are you going to high school? St. Ignatius. Where are you going to high school? Fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. She went to the taste of St. Ignatius. Now, St. Ignatius, you know, is $18,000 tuition for one year. You should get a doctorate when you come out of there. <laughs> so it's 18000 So she's been applying, applying, and her mother had told me, you know, not to, maybe about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, she said, I tell them, I. I'm at my job barely can. All I have right now, all I can possibly give to this school is fifteen hundred dollars. And I said, "Well, you know, it's eighteen thousand. She says, "Yeah, that's all I have. That's all I can do." I said, "That's all you're going to do, and it's going to be so." Her and Elisa and I said, "We're going to Ignatius. That's, that's not even a question. Just keep speaking what you've been speaking for all these years." So Ignatius, a week ago, told her. We're going to give you $10,300 towards your tuition. Hold up. The Daniel Murphy scholarship gave her $4,000. And the Gallagher scholarship gave her another $4,000. Her total tuition for, for all four each year is $200. Wow. <laughs> now, watch this now. I, I said, Diggy, I said, you know, God know you didn't want to use up all your money on that fifteen hundred. So the other the other thirteen hundred is to do all the things you need to do. So the two hundred is all you need for this. So so I said to Alicia yesterday, I said, you know what? You've spoken this thing and you've spoken this thing and you've spoken this thing and you did not budge. You didn't look at your circumstances. You didn't look at your situation. You didn't look at the reality of around you. You continue to speak what you believe. And a little child. A child spoke about what her vision was of what she was going to do, and now it is manifesting. Do you hear me? What I'm trying to say that is how important this is to understand this that we look at some things and they look impossible. It looks like there's no way in the world. Do you understand that the God you serve loves impossible situations? Because that's a place for him to show up and show up. That's when he walks in and says, you are going to understand that at least yet every person that ever asks you how you went to Ignatius, you got to say, God. See, you got to understand that the realities we see too often begin to shut down our vision. Your Never let your sight affect your vision. Say that again. Never affect your sight affect your vision. Sometimes you gotta close your sight 
to focus on your vision. And sometimes it doesn't come right away. She took the test there. She didn't take the test anywhere else. I'm taking it there because I'm going there. No way in hell was there a possibility for her to go there. But she's going there. Why? Because of what she knew. Uh, look at the person next to it and say, neighbor, what you know is more important than what it looks like. What do you really know? Do you have life in you? Do you have revelation in you? Hold on to what you know and not what you see. Because of a revelation you have, you can walk into situations that seem absolutely impossible and smile and give God some glory. As I told you just before we began here, nothing drives the devil crazier than you're in the middle of the storm praising God. He just gets so angry with that. Because now you are operating in what you know and not what you see. He throws stuff at you to see. But it's because of what you know, you can still lift your hands and give him glory and give him praise. Because of what you know, I have, see, I have this light because I have this light. Let me explain to you this way. I want you to make sure you understand the difference though. I can take a light bulb right now and hold it up. And you tell me it's a light. It's a light. But me holding that light bulb doesn't turn it on. Because it has no light or no power. I want you to understand that. We cannot be the light if we ain't got the light. You just a bulb holding yourself in the hand. You got to have the power within you, the revelation, the glory of God living. You got to have that life living in you, and that's what gives life to the light. And now you can be the light wherever you go. Once you understand that, because of what you know, you're the light of the world. And guess what? You can't hide it. You can't hide it. Why? Because our obligation, our responsibility, our command is to bring that light wherever I go. So if there's hell in your block, that's your fault. There's hell in your workplace. Light it up. Some of y'all need to go in your houses and say, it's a new day here. I just understood what I got. Y'all sit down. <laughs> it's a time of understanding. You know, you need to go home. Some of y'all need to go to your home tonight. That's everybody. It's like, listen, it's a new day in this house. They, they, they're going to say, well, you better stop going to Bible study. You messed up everything in this house. <laughs> but you have that authority, co creator. You can come into place and speak life. But you can't bring light to dark situations and dark places and dark people unless you've got the light in you that's lighting you up. Because of what you know, you're the light of the world and you don't have a right. You are commanded not to hide it because the world needs his light and his life. Because where there is no light, there is no revelation. See, you come into a situation and bringing light does not mean you're not just happy. You're coming in to bring revelation. You're coming in to bring word. Because anything can make somebody happy, but the word will get them joy. Yes. Happiness comes and goes. But the joy the world can give you, the world can't take away. Once they get the word, you got to get them the word. Say the word. Word. So our job is to bring the word. He says, you are the light of the world. What he's really saying is, you are the word. You are the word to the world. Bring my revelation to the world. Walk into chaos and give, say, let there be light. That's why when you see people walking around, 
looking like they're the walking dead is because they have no revelation. See, sometimes we see somebody looking like they're walking dead and we think it's because of something they're going through. What you're going through cannot hold you down if you know who you are going through it. We give, we give permission to be down because, oh, I'm going through this, or, oh, my bills are this, oh, I got this going on in chat, I got this going on here, I got this going on here. So we give that permission and make that the excuse of why we're down. No, the reason you're down is because you ain't got a revelation. If you got a revelation, you can walk through that thing, and as I said, either get through it or overcome it. So the walking dead are the, re are the revelation. Now let me take it one step closer, bring it a little closer home. You can be in church every single week and still be the walking dead. Mm. You can be in church every week and still be the walking dead. Why? Because there is no revelation. There is no revelation. That's why we worship. We worship to get up in the presence of God. I want to get up in you so that you can give me the things I can't get from anybody else. I got a word, but I need you to give me the revelation. How do you know that, Peter? Only the Father can tell you that. We need the revelation because the revelation is what brings the light, which causes the light to shine. And go into church and, and week after week and walking like the walking dead is not only crazy, but it's bad witness. We have to have the revelation. Because the devil, what the devil is trying to do is clog your word flow. Trying to clog your word. That's why either at church or at home or at Bible study and you're trying to study the word. And, and you see your phone. Oh, and you're back on your phone. You're answering a text. Don't you know the devil knows how to text? <laughs> he knows how to Instagram, Twitter. He knows all that stuff. He will distract you. You can leave the radio running in the background and he'll put on a song to take you back to something you tried to leave. The devil will use whatever he do to try to block the word flowing. So we have to understand that, that, that we can go to church and have the revelation block because the devil is trying to clog us from getting the flow of God's word because without his word, there's no light. And without his light, there is no light. He wants us, listen to me, he wants us to go through the ritual. He wants us to go through the performance. I went to church. I looked at my hand. I prayed. I went home. I went to Bible church. I went home. He wants us to go through all that because it appears then that we are plugged in. <coughs> I can say right now this is plugged in, but it's not. It appears this mic is okay. But what is not? Plugged in. It's not plugged in. And if it's not plugged in, it's not working. If I'm not plugged in to my prayer time, I'm going to a ritual. I'm just every morning at 7 o'clock I pray. Right. No, do you pray or do you go through a ritual? When you're blessing your food, you just go into a ritual or are you really understanding, God, this meal is a gift. When you get up in the morning, you understand waking up is a gift. You understand when you go into church, it's a gift. Why? Because he ripped the veil and allowed me to get to his presence. So he wants us to just perform and just go through because there is no light without light. And he likes darkness. He likes the world to be dark. And the reason the world is so dark now is because his light bearers have not let the light of God, the revelation of God, shine through them into the light, into the world. Any area where there is no light, where there is no revelation, there is no light. <laughs> There is no light. 
any area where there is no light and no revelation, there is no light. If there is no revelation, <laughs> your finances are going to stay broke. <laughs> if there's no revelation, your marriage is going to be under attack. If there's no revelation, you're going to keep sick. If there's no revelation, you're going to keep running through circumstances that you are neither not going to get through or didn't even have to go through because you lack the revelation. And the areas most precious to us is where the devil wants to come the most. He wants to come into your health. He wants to come into your family. He wants to come into your relationships. He, he wants to come in through those because we don't get the revelation to keep him out. He wants to abort our purpose like he wanted to abort Jesus' purpose. And only if we have the revelation we can stop him at the door and let him know the wrong one. You have come to the wrong house this time. Say after me, I need, I need some night, some light. Some if I'm going to live, I'm going to live. Jesus, Jesus is the light of the world. The world. Without his light, there is no light. I'm tired of darkness. I have the ability to change it. If the Word of God, the revelation of God, lives inside of me. All right, go to John 1 14. John, back to John again, but this time 1 14. Oh. So I'm not speaking as a creator. We won't get through this. All right, John 1 and 14. Uh, Gospel of John, first chapter, verse 14. You got to say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's read this verse together. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have what? Seen his glory. The glory of the one and the only who came from the Father full of grace and truth. Now, first of all, it's so important that we get from the verse 1 to verse 14. Because the word has to be made flesh. And John 1 and 14 says the word, the word that created, the word that casts out devil, that word that can create things. That word, all of that, became what? Flesh. Flesh. In other words, God packaged the word that created. He packaged it and made it flesh. He took the power of the word that created and said, now I need to take this power and I need to package it in flesh. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And the scripture said, and we saw his glory. See, there has to be some physical manifestation if the glory of God is present. The glory of God doesn't come just to be there. The glory of God always comes to do something, to transform something, to change something. That's why we have all these churches in Chicago and ain't nothing changing. And there ain't no glory coming out of the churches. There ain't no glory being revealed. We have enough glory to retire the police department. If we allow the glory to be revealed, the word comes to be made flesh and it dwelt among us. In other words, they said, we saw his glory. Do you know people are waiting to see the glory of God. They're waiting just like transfiguration. Peter, James, and John go up to the mountain with Jesus. They're up in the mountain. They say, let us build three tents here by Sunday's gospel. And Jesus doesn't let them do that and go back down the mountain. The next verse, I think it's the 37th verse, it says, when they got down the mountain, the people were waiting. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, God. Why is what we do on Sunday so important? Because it's not just about us. It's about what we get here. 
to go out and bring it to the people who are waiting. Somebody in your job, somebody on the street, somebody in your family, somebody in your box, somebody's waiting for the love of God. Somebody's waiting to see his glory. And the reason a lot of people stop going to church is they say all the people go to church, but I don't ever see any glory. So, so they said we saw his glory, physical manifestation. We saw the manifestation of the word. The word became flesh. Now, do I mean God took all of himself and put all of himself in the flesh? No. God has to release himself in the earth based on our ability to handle it. Hmm. God had to put himself in the earth based on our ability to handle and to comprehend his glory. God could not release all his goodness in the earth all his godness on the earth because we couldn't handle the totality of his glory. Oh, God help us. Remember he told Moses, turn away and I'll pass by. We cannot handle the totality of God's glory. I get so crazy, angry when I people say, we, we need to see your glory mark up. No. He's waiting for you to show his glory. You wait for him to do what he called you to do. <laughs> we couldn't handle the totality of his glory. As a matter of fact, remember the scriptures say even the angels had to cover their eyes for the glory of God because they can't handle the full glory of God. So what God did is he sent the word of himself and he packaged it in the flesh. He packaged his word in the flesh. That's why he's 100% God and 100% man. He packaged his word in the flesh and called it my son. Yes. Called it my son. But his son is none other than God himself. Y'all hear me? Don't get confused. He called it my son, but his son is God himself. It's just the word of God now packaged into the flesh. The word was made flesh and all that word came down and what? Dwelt among us. And, and, and we beheld the only begotten of the flesh. God released his glory in the earth. Now, let me, let me make that a little clear for you. God released his glory in the earth. He packaged the word in flesh because God is spirit. Right. Work with me now. When we were created in the image of God, you were not created in flesh in the image of God. Amen. Okay. We were created in the spirit of God. When we were created in the image of God, you were not created in the flesh of God. We were created in the spirit of God. The image of God is the spirit of God. So when it says we are created in the image of God, it's not about what you're doing with your hair. It's about the spirit that lives in us in which we live, move, and have our being. Not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. When you look, we are not, we are, the image of God is the spirit of God. In other words, when you go home tonight and you look in the mirror, that's not you. Okay. God said he, he took too much medication tonight. <laughs> when you look in the mirror, that's not you. You are literally occupying rental space. God don't hear me. This is not me. No more than that baby in a manger was God. It was the flesh he packaged 
You and I are spirit. This ain't me. That's not you. Your body, you're literally occupying rental property. Your body is rental property. Okay, since you're not getting this, <laughs> put your hand on yourself and say, this body, this body is, rental is rental property. Well, one more time, this body, this body is, rental is rental property. That's why the Bible says that we are vapors vanishing, we're already passing away, that one day we drop this robe of flesh. In other words, I guarantee you, in 10 or 20 or 30 or 40, your lease is going to be up. Your lease of this is going to be up. If you understand that, you don't put everything into this. I don't own this. I'm leasing. And one day, my lease is going to be up. Old folks had a song that I used to love and they used to sing it in the old Baptist church. There's a leak in this old building. Some of us here know we already got some leaks. It may be that leg pain. It may be that back pain. It may be your eyesight. Maybe you're hearing. How many know you got some leaks in the building? This is not me. So I have to stop spending so much time trying for me to be all that. This ain't me. I'm leasing this. I'm leasing this. And, and, and so if this is rental property and the lease is going to be up, so I was, so I was spirit before I was packaged in this body. Okay, get it this way. You were spirit before your mama and your daddy conceived you. Uh, okay, I, I know this, this struggle is, go with me. In other words, you were spirit and then you were packaged into this body. Your spirit was packaged into this body. Your mama and your daddy conceived. But I was in eternity and didn't even know it. Remember we said in the first class, there's eternity, there's time, and there's eternity. Because I am in Christ, this time doesn't hold me. I came from eternity. I'm walking through time. And when I drop this robe of flesh, I step back into eternity. So don't cry for me when you see my rental property in a casket. I'm just going back from whence I came. I was before this. And I will be after this. Do you understand me? Say after me, I was, I was in, eternity in eternity and didn't even know it. Didn't know it. Oh, you say, well, how could you back that up spiritually? Jeremiah, yes. I knew you before you were in the womb. Called you by name. Yep. So we get all caught up in this leasing property and and as we lease this property we try to make it so much and make give so much effort and so much time to it and we don't give time to the spirit that was before it will be after yeah. see in order for the spirit to come to earth it had to come through flesh the only way your spirit could come to earth was through flesh God does not change the rules. So God allowed our spirit to occupy a body. 
Our spirit occupied a body and that body was flesh. And when you have a relationship with him, you leave this flesh and I go back to eternity. Say, I started in eternity and I'll end in eternity. That's why this is not the end. It's like if I'm going, you know, downtown and I get on the bus on State Street, when the bus driver stops it, says, Fit to fit, I don't get off. It's not the end of the journey. It's just a stop along the way. Now, along our journey, some of us may be getting off at 35th or 55th or 65th or 69th, but guess what? I'm getting back out because that was just a stop. This is just a stop in time. Now, the question becomes this. If I come from eternity and I'm stepping into time to go back to eternity, what the hell are you doing with your time? <laughs> God said, I brought you. See, it's, it's just about time, so I ain't got to stop on this. But please just get this point. You don't get anything else I've said tonight. God packaged his word in a package called flesh. God called you and packaged you in a package called flesh. Now, the reason you look like your mama and daddy is because flesh looks like flesh. So I got to ask you, are you looking like flesh? Or are you looking like the spirit you were before the flesh? Uh, see, if you understand before this I was that, then that's what you've got to bring to creation. So that when you're born, knowing who you are in the spirit, packaged in flesh, for a time, in the time you're here, because the spirit of God, the life of God, and the light of God lives in you. Somebody should look at you and say, and the glory will come on them. They don't want to say Terrence lived here. The glory of God. And we saw his glory. Thank you. We saw his glory through Tulani. We saw his glory through Peachin. We saw his glory through Tarantown. We saw his glory through Ken. We saw his glory. I want to see you. <laughs> what you got to give the world? They want to see the spirit you brought in with you. So when you drop this robe of flesh, I step back into that spirit to give an account for what I did with my time. I'm just like the folk coming out of jail. I I'm just doing time. <laughs> see, see, eternity, you'll find you'll end in eternity. Death is not an end, it's just a transition. The wages of sin are death, but the gift of God is eternal life. That's why, I mean, one last quote, I promise you, this is it. One last quote, 1 John 3. Because you've got to get this to make sense of all I just said. Or you're going to go home and not believe me. 1 John 3. 1 John 3 and 2. One John, not the Gospel John, not one John. Well, not the Gospel John, one John, right before Revelation. Oh, Jesus. I tried, God, I tried my best. I tried my best. I tried my best. One John, the third chapter. Let's go bless you. See. Remember, 
Remember, we are working out our what? Salvation. Salvation. So in my time, I'm working out my salvation. What you see in the mirror is not you. What you're looking at right now is not me. Okay. Now let me back this up in Scripture. 1 John 3 and verse 2. Look at verse 2. Read this together. Dear friends, now we are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. So I'm in this package. I let this package go. And when I see him, I'll see who I am. This is not who I am. It's the spirit and the life and the light of God in me. That's who I am. So I cannot truly, fully see who I am until I let this go. And I see him. And when I see him, spirit, I see me, spirit. And I'm in the image of God. I'm working it out. I'm working it out, and guess what? And I'm working out of this. So one day I drop this rope. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. But that ain't me. I came from eternity. I stopped in time. And I'm going to eternity. This is just a stop on the journey. I won't see me until I see him. Thank <laughs> you.